Welcome. Uh, so glad you could join us uh, early this morning for our Critical Issues Forum. I'm Diana McKenzie. I am partner and chair of the Information Technology and Outsourcing Practice Group at Hunter McLean. I've, I've been here, came down, because uh, I have family here in Savannah about eight years ago, uh, and was very grateful uh, that uh, several, uh, really all of my clients came with me. So I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to uh, be presenting this topic with you today. I've got a few people here um, that I'd like to recognize. Um, Alderman Julian Miller, uh, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, we're really glad you're here. Um, and then a, a number of members of uh, my team um, are here as well. Uh, Milt Peterson, I believe, is here. Uh, uh, great, um, Nicole Pope, David Burkhoff. Um, these are all folks that live and breathe in the technology world every day, and they're all really, really good lawyers. And we're delighted to have them um, on our team here at Hunter McLean. Our topic today is cybersecurity, um, a topic that's been in the news a lot lately. And there's statistics everywhere, right? I mean, Gartner's talking about an $80 billion industry this year. Ponymon, which is the big institute that talks about and measures cybersecurity, is talking about the average cost of a breach being about $7 million. Um, but our goal today isn't to scare you. Our goal is to try to let you leave this session today with some practical ideas on what you can do to make your organization more immune to cybersecurity threats. I've got a great panel. On my far left, uh, Kevin Mooney, who has, for the last 12 years, uh, been senior counsel and headed up the IT uh, law practice um, at the Cleveland Clinic. He's recently been promoted and is now basically ahead of all of the data initiatives uh, for the Cleveland Clinic, which I'm guessing has quite a bit of data to worry about. Um, fun fact about Kevin, um, he's actually the author, uh, with his daughter, of a uh, children's book, which is very feminist children's book, um, which was basically a retell of the story of Oh My Darling Clementine. Mm. So if you want to ask him about that. Um, Cheryl, um, I think everybody in the room probably knows, um, is CIO of Gulfstream. Um, and has previously been CIOs of other uh, New York Stock Exchange companies. Um, her fun fact is that she loves to knit um, and is a very prolific knitter, knitting f all sorts of fun things. Uh, for her, it's a relaxation technique. Finally, James uh, is co-founder and CEO of Cape Augusta Digital Properties. Uh, which is a wholesale data center development company, and they're doing tons and tons of interesting things uh, in Augusta to figure out how to manage and aggressively develop uh, wholesale data. Uh, when I asked uh, James for a fun fact, no surprise, he talked about he was a serial entrepreneur, and he talked about some of his technology initiatives. Um, but the one that I thought was really cool was he also um, puts a lot of money into rare and endangered South African wildlife, especially the sable antelope and the Cape buffalo. Um, and I, for one, had to learn what those were. So let's talk a little bit um, today about what it is we came here for. I really didn't want to waste a lot of time with introductions. Um, and the first question that I've got, I will um, address uh, to Cheryl, and that is, um, but I'd like each of our panelists to talk about it briefly, which is, what trends are you worried about in cybersecurity? So I think uh, we've seen in the news um, the fair amount of hacking that's gone on from Russia. For most of us, that's not going to come into our businesses. One of the concerns that, that I have is the commoditization of malware. Malware is malicious software. and um, Particularly in the last few months, the CIA hack, anybody remember seeing that in the news? So what, what they don't tell you in the rest of the story, some days you miss Paul Harvey, um, what you have to think about is that all of the tools 
that were built by the CIA for use out in the wild have been released into the wild. So tools that they used to use against foreign nationals uh, are now available on the dark web. Who, uh, who can tell me about the dark web? Yeah, so there is a part of the internet that is uh, not a great place to be, uh, and you can buy, so if you're a young hacker, a small time hacker, you can go and buy software that will execute maliciously against whoever you choose to run it against. You used to have to build your own. Now you can just go buy your own. So it's sort of an inflection point. And I think it'll be interesting over the next six to nine months to see how those um, come into the commercial space. But it's, it's something that when you read about cyber issues in the news, one of the things you always have to think about is what, it, what does it really mean and uh, the CIA hack is one that I think we're going to hear about for a long time. James, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, I think that uh, part of the part of the issue there is if you look at um, at um, <coughs> the availability of skills to mitigate cyber threats, mm -hmm. um, this points to so exactly what you were saying the 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 ingress of a um, a, a new a lowering of the bar of entry to to cyber um, the cyber attack creates a, a compounding problem in terms of human capital development. One of the biggest issues we see in the industry is that we don't have enough people in the space. Um, a lot of organizations are, are scrambling to find individuals. You, you have companies like KeyW um, that talk about 20, 25 percent um, st uh, uh, staff volatility, so people moving on to new jobs uh, in competing industries. Um, and so unless, unless the industry gets behind scale development of human capital and capability, we're always going to be behind um, the eight ball on the problem and never going to get on the front foot, typically, uh, especially with the, with the addition of this, um, this commoditized technology that is available to everybody. In the healthcare space in particular, I would say the things that, that worry us and, and the things that are trending, one of them is ransomware. There's an uptick of ransomware, about 300% year over year. And what's so fascinating about ransomware is that it has shed a light on the, uh, the industry. We have certain hospital systems that actually don't back up their systems still. And when you don't back up your system and you get attacked by ransomware, you're going to get shut down uh, and clinical care is not going to happen. So this becomes a really dangerous thing. The problem with healthcare, the cost of healthcare is 20, 25% of the GDP and it's got to be changed. There's a lot of tight budgets and there's a culture of passivity in healthcare, I think, that, that doesn't really help out. So ransomware really gotten a foothold in healthcare recently. Uh, there's a great example in 2016, the Appalachian mm -hmm. Regional Medical Center um, was hit by ransomware and they weren't ready and they were shut down for over three weeks. Now, the industry was watching to see what they would do and to see how long a hospital system can rely on pen and pencil in order to run their clinical operations. They shut their electronic medical record down for over three or four weeks and they had no idea what was going on. Um, another big trending in, in the healthcare space, just the medical mobile devices, any of the mm -hmm. IoT devices that are out there. We have millions upon billions of devices probably on the market at this point. And in the healthcare space, we have a lot of, a lot of these uh, devices that are always connecting into the network. You're wearing them on your wrist or on your ankle or wherever. Um, and the reality is, I've seen a report, and I, I think it's, it's about accurate, that 70% of these devices actually don't encrypt their communications. So if I'm, if I'm a cyber criminal, and I know that if I hack 10 of these devices and seven out of 10 times, I'm gonna be able to infiltrate the uh, communication system and, and do whatever I wanna do, I'm going after it. Um, and that's a real problem. I think what happens is people build fast and they fail fast, but they don't really think about um, the security components of a lot of these devices. And as we know, you know, a, a weak link in the chain of the, the, the digital perimeter is going to expose the entire system. Mm -hmm. So those are two of the big ones that, that, we, uh, that keep us up at night. So I'd like to go back. This time I'm going to start with James, which is wh what do you do? What do you do as an enterprise to try to bolster your institution and minimize the threat from cybersecurity? Um, and just one or two ideas would be great. 
Yeah. <laughs> if I had the answer to that question, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, I think first and foremost, there needs to be a cultural shift in, in, in business um, uh, across the board, small, medium, and large. And what you're seeing is that in, in large enterprise, um, who have been the victims of this for a very long time, there is a, a um, well-developed institutional capacity um, for, for dealing with the problem, and there are smart people like my colleagues on this panel who, who have been active in the industry and working on it for some time. Um, but I think um, the issue is that the C-suite for medium to small companies uh, doesn't understand viscerally the issue of cybersecurity. We understand it notionally, but it's not like physical security or maintaining the security of your inventory or, um, or understanding uh, you know, where, you, where you keep your funds and how those funds are transfer, transferred or um, uh, audit risk and, and the, other, the other aspects of risk in the, in, in the industry. And that's largely the fault of what technology has done over the last 20 years. We favored technology as an enabler for growth and risk in there was you know, uh, it was about advancing time to market, it was about getting faster and cheaper and better. Um, but what happened is this blind spot that we now see has developed and what, what needs to happen is a, a broad corporate education program so that, that organizations, before you start employing people, understand how to strategize around it. Um, so I think this whole issue of human capital development is really front and foremost um, uh, the, the starting point. And, and what I like to say is there, it's a continuum of talent. You know, when you talk about cybersecurity, you think of um, the smart technology guy, um, you know, the, the PhD in, in software design or engineering as being the candidate to resolve that issue. But the problem is that cyber is, is multifaceted. It crosses all of the aspects of your business. So, you know, to use the medical analogy, you need the security guard all the way up to the neurosurgeon, and you need all of the management capabilities. All of those have touch points into cyber, and organize, organizations need to, to really get behind that and understand that. And that's a community and a, and a, and a um, higher ed. It's a, it's a um, a technical college problem, it's a school problem, um, so, so we really need to understand this uh, and, and get behind it. Great. Kevin, what, do you want to address that a little bit, what, what y'all are doing, because that, that's kind of your job these days, right? Yeah, <laughs> that is my job these days. Um, I, I would agree with James. I, I think we're talking about a culture shift, so there's a lot of tools. The market is flooded with, with tools, but if you don't have the right culture, you, you can't actually go to the board or go to the, to the leadership and actually find the funding to do what you need to do. So you, it, it, the funding is difficult if you don't have a culture of, of security. And for me, um, I always think about cyber as like a two-sided coin and everyone knows that everyone's already been breached. It's not an if, it's, it's a when and it's a when again and again. So mm -hmm. my choices are this. We can either just be very fatalistic about it and say we're going to get hit and it's going to happen and woe is me and the sky is falling. Or we can say, you know what, we're pretty sick of this and uh, let's arm up properly and go to war. And, and for me and, and the Cleveland Clinic, that's the position that we've taken. So uh, we've fired up an enterprise data governance office, which I lead um, just from a personal perspective. And what we did is we put that group smack dab in the middle of, of all the support groups so that we can have a cross-functioning, hardened team that actually supplements each other with what we do. So the IT security staff, compliance, privacy, legal, my police force, um, and risk management all have a part to play within my group, and my group has a part to play within that group. So what is, what, but what does it look like? So when we get attacked, we used to have the, um, the typical response of you detect the problem, um, you identify it, you contain it and then you eradicate it. But I think that what we've seen, and I think these guys would agree, it's gotta be a much wider chain and a cycle where there's proactive training on the front end with your, with your workforce, all of your workforce. So we have cyber defenders at every level of the organization. Even within you know, everybody's job, if they're touching data, should understand that. Uh, but then building out a very strong response plan because you're gonna get hit and you have to be, you have to be ready for this. Um, and a quick shout out for all the other lawyers in the room. Get your lawyers involved early. Mm -hmm. We don't like to deal with this on the back end. Um, if you have a lawyer, if you have in-house counsel, 
helping, using the legal mind to help build out the business model and the, and the response plan on the front end is going to be wonderful uh, when the government regulators come knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. um, then you go through the cycle on the, on the back end of a, of a security incident or, or a reportable breach. Uh, you need to take what you've learned, those lessons learned, and implement that into the next chain of, of study and training of the workforce. So it's just making a much more robust um, a program as we go. Cheryl? So I think, uh, I think most of the people here are in small to medium-sized businesses. So part of, I think, the way I'd follow on to this is to add some really practical things that you can do. The first is, so I moved to, it, I moved to Savannah from Atlanta just over a year and a half ago. Y'all are very nice. This is, that, it has to be one of the greatest attractions to living here is how nice everybody is. You know what your biggest weakness is? You're very nice. Right? Nice people believe other people are nice. People who are trustworthy tend to trust others. The first thing I would recommend is that you, uh, I have a book I recommend, it's um, Henry Kissinger's World Order. I would suggest that you read it, particularly if you have, I've spent a lot of time working around the world, I'm talking uh, China, India, Brazil, throughout Europe. It would be super valuable if you own your own business, if you're a manager in a business, it's one of the best development things you can do is read a book like World Order that takes you through the way that other countries think. So China, who's heard of China called the Middle Kingdom? Do you know why it's called the Middle Kingdom? Because there's God and there's Earth and in the middle is China. And not for a few years, for thousands of years, their entire history, they are the middle kingdom with supremacy over all the world. The way that they view themselves in the world across millennia colors everything that they do and how they act and how they think. This is something that we need to know more about, and, and uh, I read a lot. Kissinger's book is the best one. Um, there's actually a whole section on, on there. It's from 2014. Uh, it's amazing. I think he's in his 90s and still writing. Read that and think about how that is so different from the American mindset because you'll have, you'll have small commodity actors in the U.S., but in general, the people you're talking about are um, out of the um, Eastern Bloc, you know, what we used to think of as the Eastern Bloc, China, Russia, even South America. Um, Pay, it, pay attention to the way other people think. I think the other one is even the smallest companies need to practice what I would call good IT hygiene. Replace your equipment. Don't wait till it's so far at end of life that there's no patching available. Um, and if, if you're buying your routers and, and uh, network equipment at like a Best Buy or something like that, do not use the default password that it came with. Change your passwords, make them complex, right? This is one of the simplest things you can do to make it difficult for hackers. Uh, the other thing is to have your people change their passwords on a regular basis and make sure that they're complex. And let me give you an, an example of what complex might look like. I personally keep a cipher that I have about 10 different passwords and then I just record a clue so I can remember when I go look at them. But um, one of the things that we find in remediating things in IT, um, I'll pick on Kevin a minute. So if Kevin's daughter is named Jane, one, the first 90 day period, it'll be Jane with her year, you know, year of birth. And then the next time he'll add one year to it. You know, so, or if uh, one of the most common is spring. It's spring, right? Spring 2017, really? How long do you think it will take a hacker? And guess what, when he comes back, what is your password going to be when you um, get changed to um, 90 days out? Summer 2017, right? So don't, don't do that, that's like an invitation. So if you come up with sentences um, where you substitute like the word for with a number four or something like that, practicing good password hygiene will do more to protect you than you expect. It's a simple thing and it's something we don't really do. The other thing is to really make sure that everybody that works for you, your family, yourself, that you practice good email protocol. Um, I believe 80% of, uh, it's, a, it's a very high number, 80% plus of large scale 
um, problems start with a single employee clicking on a payload from a single email. And let me give an example of that. So a company that I work for, we, we did have a, um, we did have an active persistent threat and we traced it all the way back to a guy in Minnesota, an HR guy in Minnesota, who clicked on a $10 off Papa John's pizza. Nice. Trust me, it was not a $10 off coupon. <laughs> so these kinds of things happen all the time and often you won't be aware of them. So investing in, um, investing in some sort of a filter that helps you um, unmask bad actors into your email. But if you concentrate on educating your people on how to carefully manage email and don't, if it sounds too good to be true, it really is. I mean, your mom told you that, it's still true. And then um, the other pieces around the complex passwords. Practice those and, and you'll do more to protect yourself than you imagine. Let's talk a little bit about training. Um, Cheryl had just brought that up, and that clearly is one of the big topics in cybersecurity, is making sure that folks do the right thing uh, when they're supposed to do the right thing and not click um, on that password. Kevin, what's worked at the Cleveland Clinic? First, I want to know how you know Jane's password. <laughs> Long time cynic after seeing passwords that get hacked. <laughs> I think I, uh, I'm going to have to go home and change all the passwords in the household. Um, one of the things that we start, and I don't want to be presumptuous and think that anyone in Savannah actually knows who the Cleveland Clinic is. It could sound like the free clinic or like a foot clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, but we are, um, we, we're actually the biggest employer in the state of Ohio. We have 50,000 employees. We have sites all over the world um, in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. We're building a hospital in London. Um, you know, I've, I've got a lot of data and we've got a lot of interaction. We're the number two healthcare organization in the country. Um, so we've got a, we got a lot of challenges. Um, one of the things that we found really helpful with training our folks is actually kind of tricking them um, and including them with uh, spoofed phishing attacks. Mm -hmm. we, we do that frequently and we gather up um, the numbers and we see the percentages and we're, we're slowly not being as astounded as we were the prior time at how many percentages of the people who click on the kitty cat, right? They click on the kitty and it goes meow, and it releases malware into the system and destroys everything. So, so cute. Right, so if we can just get people past that moment when they just, you know, they, they're not looking at the headers, they're not trained to look at the headers, they're not trained to really, so my email is mooneyk at ccf.org um, and I get, I don't know, 300 a day. If it, it was from a phishing attack and it said Mooney K at cce.org or ccf.erg, mm -hmm. I might not see it. So the training is really sometimes at that level too. Uh, and, and when you include these people in, in those phishing um, expeditions, it's important to go back to them and show them what they did and let them know you're not in trouble. We're just trying to train uh, and give people that, that safety so that they can have a, um, a healthy interchange with the right folks in the organization. For me, that's my, my HIPAA official, um, my information security folks. And again, I'm, some of my comments are gonna come from being in this behemoth organization. I know we have mm -hmm. small organizations here, but a lot of this is just cultural mm -hmm. that you can implement at any level. Um, it, at any level of organization, a small, medium, or, or big-sized organization. James, what have, what have you all done to try to bolster your training? Because you sure have a lot of data. Uh, well, so, so from a training perspective, um, I, I think the, where we focus our attention is really in trying to provide a pipeline of capacity uh, into, um, into small to medium um, enterprise who are struggling to find people. Um, uh, as a venture fund, what, we, what we're looking to do is um, deploy capital in areas where we can make a difference in the space. Uh, and I think the important lesson is that um, there is a growing community of service providers out there who can assist small companies uh, in dealing with this very real threat. It just needs to be prioritized. Um, and so uh, what we've done is we've partnered um, where, where we, when we, uh, conceptualize a campus that we want to develop out as a data center mixed use facility, we, we identify partners in the area who um, represent a, a managed services proposition into that community. 
And so in Augusta, we partnered with a company called EDTS who um, have an existing um, regional managed services businesses which is now pivoting strongly towards cybersecurity mitigation because they're seeing in every single day that they engage with corporations. Those, co those companies are, um, are struggling to deal with the traditional line of business IT workload and understand how, that, uh, how, to, how to resolve those issues. Cyber is a low priority. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, I think the takeaway is, yes, you can do a lot as an organization to train your people and you must, uh, particularly your leadership. Um, and, and there are organizations out there that um, are, are really getting behind uh, scale development of, of, of people and talent into this marketplace. So we could, you know, if you look at the job shortage in cybersecurity professionals, it depends on which numbers you believe. Anything from 200,000 to a million vacancies across the US, uh, something like six million, world, uh, 6 million vacancies worldwide. Um, so, so, so that needs to be resolved, and, but the important takeaway is you're not alone. There are a growing set of service providers out there who are very good at solving uh, these problems, and small to medium enterprises need to reach out into those communities and, and when they hear about them, inquire. So one of the problems, and James, you rightly brought this up, is trying to hire good security folks for your organization, because there's not enough of them. And I think it's also hard for a lot of companies to figure out who the right person is to hire, right? I mean, who's good and who's bad? I want to start with you this time, Cheryl. What do you, what do, you do? So there's, a, so there's a couple things, and I want to um, touch on what James just said, too. One of the things, if you know people in the IT space already, one of the best places to find a really good cyber individual is somebody who's already doing IT. Database administrators, system admins can often be educated in what to look for. It tends to be sort of an affinity or a talent. So that, it doesn't have to be somebody who's never done any kind of IT before. It's often a good conversion point. Um, we, let's see, a year ago in January, we hired a new chief information security officer. So we went through the search, and, and I've done this uh, in a prior life as well, and I decided at this time what I really wanted was somebody who knew uh, how to deal with breaches because they do happen, they will happen. So you have to plan for that. If you can do that, everything else comes along with that package. So what I did, I, I just drew a very simple square. So I, interviewing each candidate, drew a square, said everybody knows how to protect the perimeter. You know the names of the best tools based on the size of the organization. And I drew an arrow into that box and I said, but what I really want to know is when they get in, because they will, what are you going to do about it? And how, how will you respond? And the person who could answer that question best was the person that I hired, and he turned out to be an absolutely fantastic security officer. But as you're thinking about what you want in someone who would protect your environment, think about how you would protect your house, right? So you think about different things. You might have cameras outside or lights. Do you have a dog? Do you have some sort of a weapon? Do you have a plan with your family? If somebody did come in, what would you do? You can't just count on locked doors and windows. So uh, the way I sum that up is I wanted a street fighter, not a desk jockey. So we hired a guy, um, and uh, Dave is former uh, Air Force Intelligence, former NSA. And uh, that is the kind of guy you want in a large organization, in a medium organization. Um, there are more and more of them available because cyber has matured in the military. So as they come out of the military into, uh, into the commercial space, these guys make great, great information security officers. So I would definitely point in the military and in um, longtime IT people that can learn cyber. Uh, and I, th I think having the leader who can train other people and coach is really key to developing the skill within your organization. Kevin, what would you add to that? Sure. I would say um, I agree. Uh, there's, when, when you think about breaking encryption, it's really it's a, um, it's a creative-based activity. So mm -hmm. it sounds like artists and musicians, people that can think outside the box. So there's this push-me, pull-me idea mm -hmm. between bringing in creative folks who might have an IT background right. um, to supplement some of the folks that already are maybe your, your ex experts in the field. 
um, versus some of the military folks who, you know, they have a really strong command and control structure, but maybe they can't always think outside the box. But there's plenty of these folks that actually are both. Mm -hmm. they, um, they do come out of a space where they have good command and control and they have the experience in the military. And they're also really creative thinkers. Um, we actually hired one of these guys out of the NSA and then the FBI, um, and he was a ranger too, as our chief of police uh, protective services. So he worked with Chris Inglis and he knows Director Comey. Um, and again, it, it sounds a little, you know, it's, it's the clinic being the clinic, but we were able to hire someone like that. Not everyone's gonna be able to do that. So when you look for a leader in that space, one of the things that we look for is somebody, you know, the CISO or the CIO, part of what I think their job is, is to be an informant to the, to the senior leadership team and to mm -hmm. really proactively keep them involved and understand um, why it's important to have a cross-functioning team instead of having everyone siloed in their own little world. Because when we do that, we're easy to be, we can be easily attacked. There's gotta be a, a leadership cohesion at the top. Um, and when you do that, you start picking the right people to, to be your defenders in the organization. Mm -hmm. James, you're hiring a lot in this area. What, what are y'all doing? I think that um, I think that the I don't think the problem is solved. I, I think that the reality is that there is still going to be a significant amount of churn um, in the marketplace. Uh, it's all about training, um, and and you've got to you've got to abandon the paradigm of the of the four-year degree professional in the space. Um, there are a lot of really competent standards out there. Um, that you can train to. Uh, so right now, cybersecurity companies, managed services, services companies dealing with cybersecurity a, a, as a product set are, are doing a lot of the heavy lifting, um, uh, developing tool sets, making it easier for you as an organization to cope. Um, but, but really this, the sector needs to be embraced in, in, and I think that there, there needs to be uh, almost political involvement at a higher ed um, at level to, to really change the way we think about staffing this, this, this uh, space. It is a major problem. And I can tell you most, most of the, um, the listed cybersecurity companies are, are battling to find the right people. Absolutely. If I can add, I just want to say sure. that um, technology is not going away and cyber attacks are not going away. I think everyone can agree with that. Um, and so one of the things that we've been thinking about back in, in Ohio is this idea, and I think James might have mentioned it earlier, you know, why aren't, why aren't we talking to K through eight and starting programs at a, at a young age? And I, I get it, by the time you start someone who's five, by the time they get out of college, the entire threat landscape is gonna change. But they're evolving with those changes if we start our kids off at a, at a younger age. And by the time they get to high school, if they've had exposure to this arena, um, they, might have, they might get certification courses in the college and, and we start a pipeline. The only reason I say that, and that sounds like it takes a long time, but it's a cultural change in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. um, and again, for us, we feel, like, uh, we feel like we're at war at a region, at the state level, at the national level. And when we start changing the paradigm, you start, you start looking at it a little bit differently. Kevin, I'm going to bring it back to you because I know one thing you've been doing in Cleveland, um, which is just awesome, is you've been building a consortium uh, to help a lot of the smaller players is, uh, deal with some of the cybersecurity threats. Sure. And I think it would be beneficial for folks here to hear about that. Sure. We spun up the Northeast Ohio Cyber Consortium um, a few years back, and, and what we did is we took the, uh, the public and private sector, um, Homeland Security is involved, the FBI is involved and the uh, local U.S. attorneys. Um, and we wanted a cross-industry um, consortium that can really help the region do several things. One is to build uh, some real-time threat intelligence and, and analysis capability in, in the region. The other is to start that pipeline of workforce development with Case Western Reserve, um, Kent State, and Cleveland State in particular. Um, and just pooling resources and, and having best practices. And what we, what we have right now is 31 of the biggest organizations in Cleveland um, who are footing the bill and, and trying to uh, structure this in a way that is gonna benefit the entire community. Um, and it's kind of a, a strange pyramid where you have producers and you have consumers. 
Um, most of the consumers are going to be the smaller companies in Northeast Ohio who don't have the money for this. But if they can pay a tiny nominal fee, then they're going to be able to consume everything that is being produced within this consortium. So they're kind of at the bottom, um, and that's the hugest population that we anticipate. At the top of that pyramid, you have the big organizations who are footing the bill. And in exchange for that, we get to make the decisions, right? And we get to be the founders and, and kind of drive the mission of, of the consortium. Um, and that's the way that we've established it. We do, we, we wanted to make it flexible because when we, again, when you think of yourself as like Savannah, Georgia, or you think of yourself as Cleveland, Ohio, you miss the big picture. Um, and so for us, we flexed it to be able to reach into the Ohio uh, emergency management system into the National Guard. We do work with the Ohio Attorney General's Office. Um, I'm actually helping the OAG with uh, writing a safe harbor for security breaches. So we're, we're interacting at the state level, but even on a national level with other consortiums. So once you start getting like-minded people together, the idea is quite simply that we're much smarter collectively than we are individually. Mm -hmm. The trick is building a trust framework where people will start sharing uh, in a safe environment. Uh, and it, that's all voluntary because everyone from different industries has different regulatory requirements. We have public companies in there, we have 501c3s like ourselves, and we have universities. So we, we work out all those details. Um, but these consortiums, I think, are going to be part of the fabric that helps the smaller <coughs> company. And I'll just, I always have this image of a, of a little rowboat outside of Manhattan Harbor with a couple blankets of smallpox in it. <laughs> and while it's out in the water, out in the harbor, the only people that it's affecting are the two or three people in the rowboat. But as soon as that rows up to Manhattan and they dock, within two months, the entire island is infected with smallpox. And it, is that not quite the same sometimes with a, a small consultant that comes to the Cleveland Clinic who might have an infected laptop that fires into my network? Um, so mm -hmm. it's incumbent upon the bigger organizations, I believe, to uh, provide that community service for the betterment of the entire um, community, particularly the small guys who just, they just don't have the resources and they don't have the money. Uh, James, what would you recommend in terms of spending money um, for organizations? What kind of uh, technology or services do you think are the most beneficial for folks to, to prioritize? Oh, it's a hard question. Um, I think that the, the reality is that um, if you become tool set driven, um, you end up in an arms race. I, I, th I, th I think, and I'm, I'm kind of belaboring the point, I, I do think that um, it's important to have smart technical teams and uh, you know, the answer to that question is at what, what kind of enterprise are you running? I, uh, I was with, the, with this, uh, the CTO of a major US bank recently um, who said that they were in a, uh, a process of consolidating expenditure across their uh, technology infrastructure budget, so they were spending $5 billion a year. They've dropped that to three and a half. They're only one, uh, one line item on their budget, which is effectively a bank check, is cybersecurity, spending over $900 million a year in cybersecurity, mitigating 1.3 million attacks a day. Um, so, so that it's a it's a broad it's a broad statement, right? I, th I think the the issue is, and I go back to education, I go back to to, to cultural change in organisation. That's a relatively low spend, high impact um, strategy for 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 a company. Maybe it's the hire of a couple of key people. Um, maybe it's a, a reindoctrination of of the C-suite in terms of what the risks are in an organisation. Um, for small to medium enterprises, that's a doable solution and looking to outsource technology partners to provide um, uh, capability. So I think that's a, that's a doable bite at the apple. If you're a large organization, you know, operating six, 60 to 100,000 line of business applications across infrastructure globally, um, you're in an arms race, you're effectively a nation state in the context of cyber and you need to be tooling up um, in a big way. So I dodged the question, but there you go. <laughs> well, one of the things in training that we've seen a lot among our client base is basically doing game shows um, with their employees to try to engage them uh, in the various training sessions. 
Um, but all these things cost money. Um, and Cheryl, I, you know, as CIO, I'm sure this is mm -hmm. an issue you address with some frequency. How do you how do you secure the funds for and get board interest in uh, spending money on cybersecurity? So fortunately, at Gulfstream. Uh, we're part of a defense company, so there's not a huge fight to get people to pay attention to cybersecurity. So that's a luxury compared to other places I've worked. I think in terms of how you can place your bets effectively as a small to medium organization, you want to have a good antivirus protection, whether that's um, McAfee or Sophos. Or there, there are a lot of good things out there that, that you can have that help you at least at your endpoint on your laptops and things like that. So invest in a decent antivirus. That will help you a lot. Um, and in some sort of email protection, if you use Outlook, there are uh, standard and some uplift things you can buy from Microsoft that will really help. And then the third one I would recommend is that you uh, form a relationship with somebody like SecureWorks or Mandiant or one of these companies. You, you can have, you can build a master services agreement ahead of time. You don't have to spend any money. Sometimes you can buy a retainership where they'll scan everything on your, um, scan everything on your network sort of as a preventative. But have a relationship in place, have a master services agreement in place so that if something does happen, you have the ability to quickly bring them in and respond. If you have a breach and you don't know who can remediate it and you have never talked to them, you may end up at the back of the line if a lot of people are affected. Whereas if you already have gone through the commercialization process with someone, it's, it's kind of honestly for some people, it's like having a lawyer on retainer, right? So you get to know them ahead of time. and. Um, so, so be do things that you can to prepare, and I think I think those are three things that, you know, if you if you don't have antivirus on your business machines, you probably shouldn't be in business because you're going to get hit hard. <laughs> Kevin, I want to go back to the board question because oh, I know yeah. you're certainly dealing with those issues. Right. I've got to imagine as a new department. Uh, within the Cleveland Clinic, how do you, how do you get buy-in from your board to spend money? You just walk stuff? in their office and tell them you spend a million dollars, or you get hit with a billion-dollar lawsuit. Right. No. Um, I think uh, dealing with boards and leadership in general can be a little little tricky, um, and we've seen statistics in the healthcare industry. I don't know if this is true, but it's a kind of a good statistic, so I'll throw it out. That claims about 80% of leadership within healthcare really don't understand cyber. Mm -hmm. They can't read a cybersecurity report. Uh, and, and that's troublesome. When you think about, if you use a public company, just by example, with a duty of, of care, a duty of loyalty, and um, trying to make good, informed, good faith decisions for the organization, it, you know, if, if, uh, if they're not informed, they can't really make good faith determinations on what's going on. And we use that as, as you know, we certainly aren't a public company, but we use some of the same processes in order to uh, keep our house in order. And there's a duty of oversight with respect to cyber, um, and there's a duty to make sure that there's actually an information and reporting system that exists and that is being utilized properly. And theoretically, if, uh, if they fail in that regard, um, there could be personal liability for them. I, I don't want to talk mm -hmm. about corporate law, and we know that you know as long as they're making informed, good, good faith decisions, they're going to be fine. Um, but the reality is, you have to bring cyber to the board mm -hmm. and to the leadership, and you have to lay it in their lap, and you have to explain it and educate them. Um, and I actually, in case this came up, I had jotted down a couple questions, but let's see if I can remember these. Uh, and anyone can increase the list, but the idea is the goal is to educate and to train and to get them to actually pool together to collectively make a strategic decision on the front end that has cyber within the fabric of the organization, mm -hmm. as if it's just as important as, important as their most um, profitable widget. So um, what part of the board handles examinations? Is it an audit committee? Is it a risk committee? Is it a brand new cyber committee? Do you bring in board members who actually have a cyber background? Do you hire like a cyber advisor, if you could, to actually help advise the organization? Um, have you tracked your highest value assets? And what happens, mm -hmm. you know, have you lined up your human and your human capital and your money to actually 
in the right places. Here's my highest value targets. These need to be protected more than the noise that's sitting in my data center. Um, these types of questions, including uh, what is, what's the cost of a cyber attack in, in terms of money, business interruption, and reputation. Once, uh, I, I believe, leadership understands these things a little more, their, their tune changes a little. And I allegedly know an old executive that allegedly used to work at a big organization in Cleveland, Ohio. And when I would allegedly sit down with him, I would tell him all the things that he needed to be thinking about in regard to the cybersecurity program at this alleged organization. And he would stop me and say, have we had a massive breach? And I would say, no, but, and he would say, carry on. Everything is fine. Um, and so it took me a while to allegedly get his head out of the sand and continue to, to inform him that we are a big organization and we are a huge target. We probably have two million attacks against our network a day. Um, we sit on nine million patient records and it's really, really rich data. So for, for our organization, or any organization, not to take that into account with the leadership is a huge mistake. And you know, one thing I would add, we've, we've talked a little bit about the lack of cyber professionals out there. Part of what happens over time, uh, if you think about companies like Target or Home Depot, if you have chronic problems with cyber that, that you demonstrate in the marketplace that you're not serious about it or effective at it, people will not come to work for you right. because their personal information isn't safe, their career isn't safe. Um, I did leave one job partly because they were not serious about security and I knew it was um, only a matter of time before it became a real issue and I think as the as the threat environment continues to grow, it's not gonna stop. And as the shortage becomes more and more real, companies, boards, and management teams are gonna find themselves having a difficult time hiring good teams to combat this if they have a bad reputation. It's sort of like an ethical reputation uh, or a, a quality reputation. There are just some companies people don't wanna work for. And I think this will become one of those factors that prevents you from hiring good people. Could I, could I add to that? There's also a lot of um, really cool, um, effective, comprehensive industry simulations um, mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, are identifying the weaknesses that could be used as a resource. So one, in, one that's particularly uh, uh, well known is Quantum Dawn which is essentially a program where the financial services sector got together with, um, with the defense community uh, and the intelligence community to figure out you know, exactly what did the financial services look like as a risk profile, um, how prepared were they, and it's run through a series of, of, of simulations and, and preparedness uh, tests uh, industry-wide, and then those corporations are sharing that information. I would encourage people trying to convince the boards of their organizations that this is an area where you, they need to uh, sufficiently capitalize uh, to go and look at those examples uh, because there's a lot of great data in there. Um, the final area I want to talk about before we get to some audience questions is what do we miss? What, uh, what talking point would you want everybody in this room uh, to know about cybersecurity that we haven't talked about so far before they uh, go off to their day today. Don't start with me. <laughs> Don't start with you? <laughs> go ahead. Um, so, I, you know, I would say there's, there's a fair amount of reading that you can do. I think self-education is something I'd, I'd really push. Like, for example, there's a great story out there. It's a historical one now uh, about, I think it was 2010. Uh, the U.S. government, the Israelis, and Microsoft teamed up to create something called Stuxnet. And most Americans don't know about this, but we created uh, malware that was dropped off in an infected thumb drive in the parking lot of Iranian nuclear facilities. And the, what this code did, and it was brilliant, it randomized attacks on the centrifuges that were run with Siemens PLC controllers. So what it would do, it would turn them off, speed them up, leave another one alone. This one would go off every Wednesday, another one. So it, was, it looked very random, and it took a long time before the Iranians understood what we were doing. But by the time we were done, we had destroyed 20% of their centrifuge capability in the country. That's great. That's a win for America, right? 
The problem is now that code is in the hand hands of the Iranians and now there is something out there called son of Stuxnet. So what you've done is taught a whole generation of bad guys by releasing that. Now what you've done is help people understand, hey, what a good idea. We can go in and attack something we never thought of attacking before, manufacturing cells. So there's sort of this escalation and this rolling thing that happens. Learn some of those stories because I think what we as Americans really need to understand is that other people do not think like us or don't think like us as average citizens, let's put it that way, and understand that art of the possible. What, what could happen and what can we do to get ready for that? Kevin? Sure. I love Savannah and I'm happy to be here with you guys and, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, but it, it's not far from my mind the fact that I'm sitting here with you guys and we're all gathered together talking about how to defend ourselves against these cyber criminals. Uh, in real time, I've got a boat off the Horn of Africa, you know, some guy crushing Red Bulls around the clock, mm -hmm. um, trying to steal my data. Um, I got state actors and activists. I've got people in China and people mm -hmm. in Detroit, um, all over the world who, while we're talking about this, are actively trying to penetrate the Cleveland Clinics network right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always think about that gap and how fascinating it is because we have to get together like this, but we have to speed up. Um, they, are, they are so incentivized. A criminal mind is so incentivized. How awesome is it? If I can learn how to break into somebody else's house and steal all their stuff, I never need to go to seven years of college and law school. Um, so there's an, an incentive in the criminal mind to be really, really quick um, and really, really active. And our incentive is not really the same. I work for the Cleveland Clinic. I have a salary with the Cleveland Clinic. I love my organization and I want to do what I can to, to um, to protect it, but the incentives aren't the same. So I think it's this constant evolution and getting our country to speed up, mm -hmm. um, again, locally, state level, and national level, and really get us all connected together so that we can, we can start uh, being quicker um, and hopefully someday as quick as the criminals. Mm -hmm. James. Yeah, now that I've had some time to think about it. <laughs> um, I, th I think that, um, uh, to, to, to touch on what has just been mentioned, there is a, um, and, and it's certainly something we haven't really focused on, as, as people enter this industry um, uh, out of educational institutions and they become operatives in cyber as they go into um, the intelligence community and the DOD, they're becoming weaponized as people. Um, and uh, what I've heard of um, uh, is a lot of leadership in organizations like MITRE that have very strong capabilities in cybersecurity. One of their biggest issues is dealing with this cultural um, education of what it takes to be ethical as a hacker. Because what, what happens is as you get exposed to these techniques and capabilities, um, all of a sudden you're a potential recruit for the dark side. Um, and and that's, that's a real problem. And, and sometimes kids can find themselves in a lot of trouble just experimenting. Um, and, it, and it completely um, uh, removes them for, as an opportunity for organizations that have a real corporate fiscal due diligence or um, have a, have a uh, even the DOD have this problem. As, as kids go into this industry, they're, they're tempted into a world that makes them non-clearable. They're very talented and they use those skills and continue down that trajectory, which is really scary. So that cultural understanding of children as they leave high school and they go into the college system and they become educated in the space, when you're becoming a cyber operative, you really are weaponizing a workforce. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, so uh, that needs to be addressed um, across the board. Great. Um, thank you, um, all three of you. I'd like to open up the questions to the audience generally to see if uh, anybody has any other concerns with cybersecurity or related topics that they'd like to address. Rebecca. Just out of curiosity, what percentage of the weakness in your networks are you seeing from people using unsecured public Wi-Fi hotspots at McDonald's and Starbucks to access company information? How do you address that? Um, I'd say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Gulfstream. As your counsel, it's something, I was going to tell right, you yeah. to say no comment. No comment. Uh, we actually manage that pretty well. 
I would say it happens, um, mm -hmm. and we do the, it's active management of situations like that and further education. Um, yeah, we, uh, I have 50,000 employees. We have, you know, 20,000 laptops and 8,000 issued iPhones. It can be troublesome at times. You know, I, I think there is a growing um, trend that will solve that eventually. Today, we think of, I have permission to get into X data. Uh, over time, we'll move to more of a model where I have the ability to get into a file that I need when I'm in the right place on the right network. Uh, and, and that kind of uh, construct will, will become commonplace within, I think, five, seven years in response to a lot of the, we, right. you know, there's something about human nature. We cannot govern ourselves. We know what we should do. It's kind of like, you know, uh, kids and drunk driving or teen pregnancy. How many times have they heard it in the news, heard it in the classroom, heard it from their parents and teachers? I mean, you name it, but they still do it because they're invincible, right? It's not going to happen. It could happen to other people, but not me. We think the same way about cyber. Other other questions? Yes, over here, please. Yeah. So the the first thing I wanted to know, uh, did they understand that there is no really useful rule book? Every attack is different. Um, as soon as the as soon as the business community becomes used to one sort of attack, something else comes up. You know, it used to be denial of service, and now it's ransomware, and you know, different things like that. So they have to, uh, number one, they have to be able to be very flexible. And uh, so again, if you think about this in, in, in warfighter terms, they have to be able to use a knife, a, a, a handgun, a long gun, their hands, um, something they make up when they're doing it. You know, they have to be, they have to be very agile and be able to respond. The other thing is they have to have a slight level of paranoia. And I'll tell you why. Most cyber incidents first look like infrastructure incidents. And it's only when either one is big enough or enough things happen that you go, huh, this is not normal. And how long it takes you to get to that point makes a big difference. I brought the woman who brought their idea and paranoid is her middle name. Good. You know why? Because she sees every day the millions. I, you know, what um, Kevin said is absolutely true. Right now, as I sit here, we've got monitoring tools going at Gulfstream and millions and millions of hits uh, every day. I mean, trying to get in. And it's, um, you know, if you could almost imagine like there's this bubble and it's not when they get in, it's which, which attempt will get in and then how you deal with that. You have to have a healthy respect for your opponent because as, you know, and again, they, one of the things I think we forget, for example, in China, we don't realize the level of effort put against the West by countries like China and Russia, where they have military units far beyond what we're talking about at you know, Fort Gordon and things like that. They've been active for a long time. And for a lot of these people that work in a nation state environment, they come in at eight and they leave at five and all day, all they do is execute scripts against FTP sites in the West. And, it, and it's, it's like this rolling army and most of us aren't even aware that it's real. So paranoid is good. And I love your analogy <clears throat> about the, uh, the box and mm -hmm. just to add to it as you were talking, I was thinking the other thing that you might want to look for is whether that person that you're hiring is a CISO or whoever the leader is, if they can actually open up the box and hand the weapons out to other people. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes there's this human aspect of people, there's a threat, oh my God, I'm gonna lock it down, I'm gonna silo, I'm gonna look like a champion, I'm gonna be the white knight, 
we don't want that guy. Right. We don't want that woman. We Good want, point. Right, we want someone who says, hey, we got an incident. We have the workflow already laid out. We know the right people within this response chain who are gonna stand up and do their task. Um, everyone's got a job to do. Mm -hmm. You fire up the team, you hand out the weapons, and you go to town. Um, and we've had people in the past who wouldn't do that, and we just, you know, weeks later, the legal department would hear about this. And that's, for a big organization, is not a good scenario. And a great way to ensure that you have that is do tabletop exercises ahead of time, and you'll see where you have people who either don't want to play or can't. So right. practice. Frank. So, so there are a lot of numbers out there. I would tell you it scratches the surface. There are the public, publicly reported numbers, and then there's a, a substrata of things that don't get reported, and then there's an even bigger piece underneath where we just don't know that we're being breached. Uh, you, you know, you'd, you'd be surprised at the number of companies that don't realize they have been breached and that their intellectual capital uh, or their data or their supplier information and what they pay for things um, ha has already been taken. So I, I would say it is probably an order of um, three or four times what actually gets reported. I think you can look at the, the industry numbers too. In healthcare, um, in 2015, a very short period of time ago, about 12% of the incidents that were breaches of protected health information were hacks. And it made up, I think, like 15% of the total numbers of patients that were reported to HHS for that year. Now you go a year and a half later, and the, the hacking attempts are up maybe like 3 or 4%, up to 16%. But they now make up 75% of that 160 million patient records that have mm -hmm. actually been accessed. That's astounding. That's in a very short period of time. And it's just, it's, it looks like it's exponentially growing. But when you, when you attach the dollars to that, you start seeing um, that the anthem size breaches are becoming commonplace. Mm -hmm. You have 40 million here, 80 million there. Um, it's a little bit different than it was just a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's fast money. I mean, the reality is you go into the dark web, you can sell social security numbers, you know, you, know, you gra gather 100 of them in the course of your work or whatever, um, you can sell them. Uh, and uh, you can make a, a quick bundle with uh, very little effort. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, panelists, for spending the time uh, putting this together. Uh, thank you uh, to all the good folks, uh, Andrea in particular and Hunter McLean that spent a ton of time uh, getting this done. And thank you to Stagefront, Savannah Technical College, and the Culinary Institute of Savannah, who are all very helpful to us at Hunter McLean uh, in making this happen. But most importantly, thank you for coming uh, and being interested in this topic. It's one we're gonna hear a lot more about um, and we're excited and thrilled to be able to have these folks with us uh, to give you a little more information. Thank you.